Thank you, everyone. I'll have to um, apologise. I don't know who thought this through, but we've just had lunch and I'm just about to talk about cod vomiting. So my apologies first up. Feel free to head off if you don't want to want to listen to this. So let me find this clicker. Sorry. Um, I just want to start with a bit of a background about me. I might look like a bit of a different cod, cod angler. So I'm a wreck angler. I'm a part-time angler, whereas Cameron, Cameron's the full-time angler but I'm a full-time scientist. I absolutely love fish. I started off doing a marine biology degree because I grew up on the coast. Then I got into freshwater science and just loved it. And lucky I've met Cameron because we can talk about fish all the time together. So, so that's really good. Um, a few projects that I work on, and I won't get into this too much, but um, we have a research facility at Charles Sturt University in Albury, New South Wales. Um, so we have an aquaculture facility there. Um, we do fish rescues, so Luke Pearce, who's in the audience somewhere, um, bought us some um, crayfish the other day, so we looked after them, nursed them back to health. Um, I'm looking at uh, redfin transfer through the Snowy Hydro um, Hydro Power Electric Scheme. I work with endangered Macquarie perch, again with Luke Pearce from Fisheries. Um, I've been involved with a project on stable isotopes and otoliths, so the ear bones of fish. Um, I've also been involved with a project called Screens for Streams, so irrigation um, intakes, where we're screening them to protect native fish. So that's just a few projects that I've worked on the last couple of years. But what started me off in my research career was Murray Cod. So um, that's actually how Cameron and I met, through, through Cod Vomit. So I studied my PhD looking at whether um, we can stock cod, golden perch and Australian bass to control carp. Now I'm just going to talk about cod obviously for this talk. Um, I'm probably not going to tell you anything new about their diet. So if I was to ask anybody, you'd say they eat everything, whatever fits in their mouth. They've got a big mouth, it's like a big bucket, they'll take it in. So I would 100% agree that you're right. So here we've got... so. We've got carp, and then our lures reflect what, what they're eating. So I've got a picture of a redfin, and one of the flies that Cameron ties up looks exactly like a redfin. Um, frogs, you've got lures that look like frogs. Um, unfortunately, that's an endangered Macquarie perch up in the corner, which we found on the bottom of the river in a cod's guts. Um, birds and mammals, so your mice. Um, ducklings, unfortunately, I've seen that a few times. Yugalas, um, Rosellas, and yeah, you've probably all heard the stories. Um, hard shelled items, so your, your turtles, your freshwater um, mussels, um, uh, hard boiled eggs, but also golf balls. Um, invertebrates, so your yabbies and your shrimp, um, bardi grubs, centipedes, cicadas, that sort of thing. And of course, most of you know these stories. So that down the bottom, that's a spinal cord from a pig, which is quite disgusting. Um, but they used to use um, cattle spinal cords. Um, whatever you call these sausage things, Frankfurt's, little boys, savoys, whatever they are. Um, cheese, of course, chicken chippies. Have I missed anything? Is there anything that anyone else knows of? Bread. Bread. Hel dimmies, I didn't put dimmies up, Helga's wraps. Yeah, so basically what we've got is they basically eat everything. So why am I up here talking about something that you guys already know? My job as a scientist is to tease out basically that mess that my angling mate has made and organise it neatly into a nice box. So I'm going to quickly give you a few ideas. I don't have too much time, but I'm going to give you a few ideas about prey size, cod size, prey availability and seasonality, which I know Cameron's already touched on, but I'll, I'll briefly mention it in relation to what I found with my work. So first, prey size. So the size of a fish, whether it's this big or this big. Then I'll talk about whether a cod is this big or this big, as you can see from that picture. So when Cameron said that he encourages people to get a cod and put it in a tank, I potentially took that a bit too far. I put a lot of cod in a lot of tanks and watched them for hours and hours and hours and hours. And I've actually banned him now from having tanks at our house because I don't want to look at any more cod in tanks. So I did this for about six months um, with 
uh, video footage there, so you can see from that picture. Um, and I manipulated different types of prey. So I also did this for golden perch and, and bass as well. So my first question was, if you put a big fish or a little fish in, will they always take the big fish or will they always take the little fish? So for golden perch, they always took the little fish. Um, but for cod, they didn't really have a preference. They took, sometimes they took the big one, sometimes they took the little one. Then when they'd eaten, again, sometimes they took the little one, sometimes they took the big one. So I really didn't find too much there that, was, that I didn't expect. What I did find was the bigger the prey item and the closer that it was to the size of the cod, the more it became territorial towards it rather than eating it. So this poor little carp here, I actually had to take it out of the tank because it was a bit rough to watch this, but it just had the absolute crap beaten out of it um, instead of being eaten. But some other cod would eat it. So this is the times when you might catch a, a small, smaller cod like this on a big swim bait that looks pretty much the same sort of size. So now we talk about Murray cod's size. So I looked at fish from about 25, 30 centimetres to that's a 1.37 centimetre cod. So that was my size range there that I looked at. And what I found, so this was out in the wild making cod vomit. I didn't kill them. They were, they were all alive afterwards. So what I found was a smaller cod, their, their diet will be dominated with prey that are crustaceans, so yabbies and shrimp and that sort of thing. So that's probably why when you, you know, you're out there and catching yabbies, you, you'll commonly catch cod. Then cod, and that picture in the middle is actually a yabby that I've pulled out of a cod's gut. Now, as the fish got bigger, so as the cod got bigger, their diet got broader. So yes, they were still eating yabbies and shrimp, but they were also including more fish into their diet. What I also found though, was generally when they had fish in their diet, they would always have a crustacean, especially the smaller ones, that 30 to 70, 70 centimetre size. Now, when I got to the big fish, so um, these fish were found on the Murray, the Ovens, the Goulburn, so 90 plus centimetre fish. This is when their diet started to get really broad and this is when it started to include things like birds and fish and turtles and, and mussels and that sort of thing. So it was these these big fish. Now what, what the main point of my PhD was, was to stop cod to control carp. One of the biggest concerns that I have with this work was these 90 centimetre cod, their diet was dominated by carp, only carp. No crustaceans, nothing else, just carp. I just want to leave you with the thought of if we remove all the carp from the system, so we know about the koi herpes virus and things like that, we, there's a chance that we could lose our big cod. So I won't talk too much on that, but that was a big um, outcome of, of my work. Now, prey availability. So when we've got a few fish and a few crustaceans, what are they going to eat? Are they going to choose something over something else? So I had carp, I had rainbow fish, gudgeons and shrimp. Now, what I found was crustaceans and fish was quite equal. They kind of chose you know, whatever was available. For some reason, although carp and rainbow fish pretty much look identical, they don't touch them, I can't explain that, but they never ever ate rainbow fish. Now what I did here was manipulated the availability of prey. So I put four carp in, then a, another fish or a gudgeon, um, a yabby and a shrimp. So I'm just gonna ask the question, what would you expect if I put four carp in the tank does anyone know if they're going to eat them more or not? Anyone? No? Nope. Well, that's good because I didn't know the answer either. So what I found was I increased the number of carp in the tank. They ate yabbies. I increased the number of yabbies in the tank. They ate yabbies. So what was happening here was a slightly different um, response. So carp actually schooled together and cod wouldn't touch them. And I'm talking about a four foot tank, they would not touch them. So when, when you propose the idea to stock a lot of cod, when you see carp, you know, you see these images of carp everywhere and oh, let's stock cod to eat them. Carp have outsmarted cod, they school together and they're not gonna be eaten like we expect them to eat them. They're gonna start eating non-target species. So 
you think about your your native crayfish, so your, your Murray crayfish, things like that, that's what they're probably going to target if your carp uh, dominate the system. So prey availability, sometimes there's different responses going on. But when I was at Mawela, they were doing, um, they were dropping the lake and a lot of the shallow water species, so your shrimp and your carp gudgeons, entered the, the main river channel. I found gutfuls of carp gudgeons and shrimp. So at times like that, I would switch to a smaller lure and, or a fly or whatever you're fishing with um, to get those 80, 90 centimetre fish. So sometimes prey availability makes a difference, sometimes it doesn't. So the, here's just a few results here. I apologise, I realise I've put scientific names up. Sorry about that, but I'll, I'll run you through it. So I've got here fish from, so it goes Ovens, Goulburn, Murray and Mawela. So definitely yabbies and shrimp dominated their diet and that's mostly in the smaller, smaller fish that I caught. Um, this was the Mawela time. So basically, what have I got there? Pretty much 90% of their diet at the time, so this was about April, May, um, was just dominated by these carp gudgeons and shrimp. Mouse plague, I was lucky enough to do this work during a mouse plague. We've currently got one on now and I suspect the same thing is going on. I found up to 19 um, mice in cod's guts, cod and trout guts. So those lures that look like mice, I 100% encourage them right now. And what was interesting is I hear a lot of people say, I know what cod eat, but I don't, I don't always catch cod. That's because I found pretty much 30 to 40% of them had empty guts. So cod, I think, are quite lazy. They don't, they're not like a, a salmoner that has to constantly swim in the current. They sit there, they don't have to eat every day. They can eat once a week. And I can tell you that from video footage of watching a cod do absolutely nothing for a week when I'm like, hurry up, I need some data. But yeah, they'll just sit there and, and do nothing to the point where yabbies will crawl on their heads and they still won't eat anything. Um, yeah, they had a lot of empty guts. So there's days when Cameron and I will be out. There's, there's weeks where Cameron and I will be out. They're just not eating. They're just not interested. I'm not saying don't fish those times because you'll still get that territorial response, um, but they are a very hard fish to catch, so don't feel bad if you don't catch them. Um, so just to summarise that, so the size of the prey in relation to the cod, it doesn't really matter. A big fish is still going to eat something big. A small fish is still going to eat something big if it wants to. The territorial response that I was talking about, that could land you a fish, so don't, don't give up there. So the size of the cod does matter. Um, so the larger prey items, and there's more variety with what they'll eat. Um, prey abundance could be an advantage and could not. Now, I'll just touch on something that Cameron said about the Ovens River. Um, that's got a lot of smaller fish. Whether that's a response to, there's a lot more um, crayfish there, so Murray Crays, Yabbies and shrimp, I, I don't know, but I suspect that those sort of rivers is where you'll find those, those smaller prey items and your cod won't get as big as compared to, say, the Murray, where they've got carp and things like that. Um, yeah, don't dismiss anything. I, I know I've really briefly touched on this. Um, but just think things through, think about the environment around you, think about what your lure does. Like I'm looking here, um, people say the spinnerbait doesn't look like any type of prey item. So I'm looking at this here and it looks like a little cod. Well, yes, cod do eat little cod. Whereas a spinnerbait, I don't know what that looks like. But a spinnerbait and an aeroplane spinner is actually creating a flow that the cod are picking up with their lateral line and it's that flow, not the visual, that they're picking up. So just little things like that. Don't dismiss anything. Just think things through. Um, and yeah, empty stomachs. They don't always feed, but be persistent because you still might land them. Um, and the location makes a massive difference as well, which is what um, people have been touching on as well. Um, empowerment fishing is very different to a river system and above and below a dam is also very different. Um, the things I can't touch on here, and I'm happy to talk about after, are weather and um, breeding season and fish metabolism, and also parasite load. I don't know if you guys have seen 
those little learnia on, on cod, that can also impact their diet. So yeah, for me, diet is a very, is a very complex thing to, to summarise very quickly. Um, but yeah, there's just a few things that, that I've found that I thought you might find interesting.